So this is a 39-year-old female who is presenting with recurrent abdominal pain. And we have a uh, CT with two phases. Change the window a little bit. Let me know if you want me to slow down or to stop scrolling or if you see anything. Let me just hide the measurements, sorry. I'm going to go to a delayed phase just because I'm having issues with the early phase. Did you see anything? That early phase, I think, was helpful too. Yeah, the early phase is really helpful. It's just, it's not loading properly for some reason. Here, this is. Anything catches your eye? Yes, he's pointing at something. Christian, speak up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's hot off of winning a competition at noon conference. So. Oh, nice. <sighs> So we're at the level of the kidneys and I see some, I, I, I think it's is it coming off of the small bowel. So I, I, I think it's vascular in origin, um, but can, can I go up to the origin of the SMA real quick? Let's see, can we, I just wanna follow it down. by each other. So this is a comparable uh, level, right? This is the left renal vein origin and this is the left renal vein here. Yeah. But there's something anterior to the left renal vein with a, a lot of inflammatory stranding around it. And a thickened wall. Um, I, I think it looks probably vascular and etiology. Like it's a vascular structure and it's probably the Oh, huh. and it's coming from the, oh, yeah, so that's the SMA. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is the SMA. Um, is there a filling defect in there as well? Or yes, am, I, am, I, am I making that up? No, you are not making that up. We, we did an MR also after the CT. So there are extensive changes around the SMA and there is a very small filling defect that's not enhancing on the delayed phase here and then going down sorry my this axial is very painful to scroll but I'm gonna go to the try to NPR this one okay never mind I'm gonna give you an MR because the CT is giving me a hard time to um to pull up so further down on the delayed phase, you also see that there are similar changes around both common iliac arteries as well with a small filling defect here that is non-enhancing, but most of the inflammatory changes are enhancing. So it is inflammatory. Wait, are the, there's like PHI when she like hovers over the... Yeah, there is an ROI because I wanted to see if this was enhancing or not. So this is the early phase, this is the delayed phase. So this most external portion of the wall is enhancing. And between the lumen and the most external portion, there's this small filling defect that's not enhancing. So there is both inflammatory changes and a small non-occlusive clot. And uh, I wonder if anything caught your eye also in one of the organs here. It's the left kidney. Yes, exactly. And then if we follow this branch that's coming to the lower pole of the left kidney, this branch here, there's a lot of inflammatory stranding around it. So this is the renal vein, and this is a branch to the lower pole of the left kidney, which was also uh, involved by the process. So what, what are your differential considerations here? So I'm thinking maybe a, a vasculitis of some variety. Uh, um, I, let's see. Exactly, yeah. vasculitis is the main differential. So it could be large vessel or medium vessel. The aorta is, is relatively spurred, so it's probably medium vessel, but large vessel is still a possibility. One thing, uh, one other thing is uh, this CT here, as I mentioned, the patient was coming with recurrent abdominal pain. So this CT 
was done only five days before this CT here. And going, looking at the SMA on this earlier CT, it was perfectly normal. So this was very rapid progression. So if you have very rapidly progressive vasculitis, what is one thing you would think of? Uh, Other than inflammatory. Did, did they change any medications? Is she infected or are they, are they infected? Infection, exactly. So one thing to think of is infectious, uh, like mycotic aneurysms, if it is rapidly progressing. Based on the clinical uh, history and the uh, markers and everything, this case is more likely to be inflammatory. But keep in mind that infectious uh, mycotic aneurysms progress very quickly. So this, this was uh, the gist of this case. Interesting. Yeah. So they're treating them, probably they got a rheumatologic workup, etc. And they're trying to figure out the underlying inflammatory process? Yes, yeah, they are. She was transferred recently and they are still uh, trying to figure out the uh, etiology. Cool. Awesome, well, great okay. case. Okay, Nelly, go ahead. Okay, all right, uh, pelvic pain. Okay. Did you see something, Artie? I didn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Um, so my resident Joe is going to take it. All right, Joe, what do you think? Hey, how's it going? Um, Hi. Okay, so we have a T2 contrast, uh, T2 MR. Yep. Uh, sagittal. Good. It looks mm -hmm. like there's... Yep, uh, urine is bright, right? So you said yeah. it's bright, so it's T2. Yeah, so it looks like there's some signal abnormality near the, the cervix, but also along the posterior aspect of the uterine wall. Um, not sure. And it almost looks like there's some abnormal tethering of the bowel posterior to there. Wonder yeah. if there's a, a fistula. Does the patient have Crohn's or something? What else can it be? Um, good. Okay. So here is the, the uterus, right? Yep. Um, and then in the uterus is not totally normal either, right? The junctional, there's a little T2 cystic spaces there. Okay. So then we start thinking, um, I don't know, myosis. Okay. And then probably the posterior, like the serosa is right here. I don't know if you can see this signal difference between uh, okay, yeah. the serosa of the uterus versus the what's outside of the uterus. It's a very subtle, um, uh, but there is a signal change. Okay. And then you have this T2 dark thing. And like mm -hmm. you said, there's tethering and it's tethered. So this is the rectum here yeah. posteriorly. And then the rectal wall should not be like, you know, it shouldn't be that thick. Like maybe this is not totally normal either, but um, mm -hmm. the wall here is like this, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's tethered. And then what else do you notice about the um, adnexa? So what are these structures here? So those look like the ovaries. It's Good. Like and where are the normal position of the ovaries? Where should they be hanging out? Should be a little bit more anterior and lateral. Good. It should be like anterior. Uh, but these two ovaries are pulled back. They're retropositioned, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's, so and and it's getting pulled, and there's this kind of kind of um, architectural distortion and yeah. tethering, pulling, like you said, to the this 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 yeah. thing here. And so what is that? So if I saw this in the mesentery, I'd be worried about like a like a desmoplastic reaction, like a it's a woman. Okay. Um, common things being common. Common thing. And this is the T1, right? So this is T1. So urine is dark and it's fat sat. So the subcutaneous fat is dark. And what do you see on fat sat T1? Um, so there's, I mean, there's bright T1 signal. So good. We're about blood, um, protein, melanin. Um, okay. So what's common? Knowing the T2 cystic changes that we saw in the myometrium. If she had a hemorrhagic cyst, uh, hemorrhagic cyst. Uh, so, th so the T two cystic changes are adenomyosis. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like you know endometriosis that involves extends into the myometrium. Oh, okay. So um, it's and ectopic then endometriosis. Yeah. So that there's different types of endometriosis. So if it's outside, um, you can have little dots of endometrial implants that's kind of around the pelvis most commonly is in the cul-de-sac these little t1 bright spots they're implants 
Um, but you can also get a different type called deep infiltrating endometriosis, which looks like it's dark and it's dark on T2 and it's um, it can invade into structures. So it can this is invading into the rectum. Um, and there's this large plaque here posteriorly along the, the retrocervical space, kind of the cul-de-sac that's obliterating, obliterating the cul-de-sac. Um, so this is deep infiltrating endometriosis, D-I-E. Uh, um, and you can also get things like endometriomas, which is like a big ball of collect collection. Um, so that's endometrioma. And then you can have the SMN. And the DIE can be um, most commonly it's in the pelvic, like retro, like the cul de sac, but it can also involve the middle and anterior compartments, abdominal wall, and then diaphragm. It can go anywhere. I think on this image, it's very nice because we see the mushroom cap sign. Yep. Yep. So this is a very yep. uh, characteristic sign. You yep. see the cap of the mushroom and the rectum and then the stump going down. Yep. Yeah. And this is so the gynecologist, what do you what do what do they want to know? They want to know how long it is. This thing is like seven centimeters, craniocondal dimension. Because if it's just superficial, like it's only invading the cirrhosis of the bowel, they can just scrape it off. But this one is in the submucosa. It's pretty deep, right? It goes in these cases, they have to get colorectal surgery involved to do a segmental resection of the colon of the rectum. Um, so they want to know like how extensive it is, how deep is the invasion, and like how long is it? How you know, multi where where is it? Uh, so that they can, you know, if there's like GU stuff involved, then they'll get urology involved. If it's rectum, which is most commonly the case, they get colorectal surgery involved. Um, in addition, there's another finding here. So there's a cystic, there's a bladder, and then the uterus, but then anteriorly there's a cystic lesion here, and it's not a simple cystic lesion. All right, there's like the signal, this mural nodule. And so you look at the pre and the pre is ISO, right, ISO. And then we look at the post and then the post is enhancing, enhancing. Um, so patients with endometriosis, they are at increased risk for malignant degeneration. Uh, like one, one malignancy that happens in patients with endo is uh, clear cell. Um, and, and that's usually more aggressive or pretty aggressive um, variant. Uh, so, uh, and so the key is, you know, endo is, um, they enhance and they restrict. And if you see that mural nodule, um, you know, those are all suspicious findings for malignancy. Awesome. You are the, end, the deep infiltrating endometriosis queen. We do a lot of it here. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I have a companion case to that, actually. Um, one sec. I have a case, another case. Oh, I'll go after you. Okay. Um, so this patient has a history also of endometriosis. I'm going to ask one of my residents to take it. Okay, Odessa. My fellow. So what do you think about, this patient had a hysterectomy, she has a history of endometriosis. What do you think about this process here? So the T2. Mm -hmm. It's a T2, mildly hyperintense mass in the anterior abdominal wall musculature. That does have that has those little T two cystic spaces in it actually. Yeah, and then I'll show you um, pre contrast. Is there any blood in it? A little bit. Okay. <laughs> Aerosine. Some hemorrhage there. And then post contrast. Mm, there's a ton of enhancement. Yep. Hmm. And she had. A hysterectomy like lepros like cut her anterior abdominal wall open took it out yes okay so did they seed her anterior abdominal wall with something possibly so what are you thinking this could be malignant degeneration of endometrial tissue good i thought Excellent. So if it didn't look this crazy and gnarly and like maybe it was smaller and more speculated, we can think about a scar endometrioma. 
but this is too big. It's got this abnormal T2 signal, like all this evil gray um, of, of tumor, it's enhancing, et cetera. So this was clear cell carcinoma, um, we think uh, that arose from a scar endometrioma. And it's actually now, and there's malignant lymph nodes around it. Um, it's invading into the bone right here. So yeah, I, this is my first case where I saw or, of malignant degeneration in a scar endometrioma, so. The T2 gray, like evil gray really helps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the scar endometriomas are tricky because they can enhance, they in, in, in elicit such a dense fibrous reaction that like all that fibrous tissue will have delayed enhancement, but it's usually either like really dark or it'll have like all those, you know, dark with T2 cystic spaces, not this kind of like evil gray. Yep. Yep. So T2 cystic intermediate, spaces. Yep. Intermediate signal is much more alarming. And it's got these like big bulky lymph nodes next to it and stuff too. So. Okay. Oh, okay, hey, great. Uh, another male and uh, presenting with this. Okay, so my um, Odessa is also taking this case and she said that she's concerned about a leiomyosarcoma that went up the gonadal vein. Yeah, I think that's a great that's thought. That's what I think it is. I mean, it could be anything, right? But it kind of- What is. else? I'm gonna give a differential DDX. What's your DDX? That's one. That's another DDX. I've never seen like a, a, a testicular tumor grow up the gonadal vein, but that's another possibility, like a germ cell tumor. Mm -hmm. It really does seem linear, like it's growing up the vein. Lymphoma looks blobby. This was lymphoma. Oh, wow. Yeah. Lymphoma. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we have to give a differential, right? Like we can't just, I, I wanted to just say this was like sarcoma or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> I added lymphoma and I'm like, thank goodness I did that <laughs> because they have to send for our PMI. Like it's, you know, when, when they take uh, biopsies, they have special, um, solutions that they have to send, like put it in if you're concerned about lymphoma. So put, you know, diff it out, diff it out. Yeah, that's an awesome case. I've, ne I've never seen it like that, like growing like that. And also like, yep. it doesn't look like there's lymphadenopathy really elsewhere. Um, it's decided to grow contiguously like this. Yeah, Not it is a really weird mm -hmm. manifestation, but, um, you know, lymphoma is one of those things that can look like anything, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, great case. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, I was saying this case is for the attendings out there. Oh, I'm not even sharing my screen. So, much, so hard to multitask. Okay. So this was a youngish female um, and this is what her liver looked like. So you can see lots of arterially enhancing lesions. This one looks almost a little bit nodular in its shape. So that was the arterial phase where there's oh, old, like youngish 20s, 30s, teens. Yeah, 30s. Okay. And no genetic diseases like von Gierke or some hepatic adenomatosis, like blockage, uh, glycogen storage disease. No. And then, sorry, actually, I skipped to the. So, sorry, that was the arterial phase. And then forget what you just saw. And then this was the venous phase. So, a lot of them were kind of blending in on the venous phase. Although this one looked a little funny, but a lot of them blended in on the venous phase. So residents, what if you have a lot of arterial enhancing lesions that blend in on, become ISO on the venous, what do you think? Uh, yes, yeah. Well, we had a lot of guesses over here <laughs> that um, I'll have to tell them about later, but um, not hemangiomas, uh, probably not HCCs in a young female without liver disease, but um, we think about FNHs. In this particular case, we did do an EOVIS scan. And you can sorry, can you show the T2 again? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll show you the T2 in a second, but you can see that they basically do not retain contrast on the EOVIS. So my FNH theory is kind of out the window. Um, they are a young female, so we were also thinking adenomas. And then these are the T2. So they are mildly T2 hy hyper intense. And I'll show you the T2 with fat sac. 
Okay. They're kind of subcapsular and distribution. Um, some are, not all. What are you thinking? Um, hemangioendothelioma. Yeah. What? <laughs> I knew you were going to say that when you said subcapsular, but I would argue they're not really targetoid. And they're is, um, is she anemic? Could it be EMH? Uh, like extramedullary hematopoiesis? Yeah. Um, so both of those are rare and um, we did not bring them up and that's not what these are. But I wanted, the interesting point of this case is basically this is a young female, has a bunch of lesions. We were thinking F and H or adenomas. They didn't retain on EFS. Then we said, these are probably adenomas. And then I just want to show you, this is the in phase. And this is the out of phase. So her liver was mildly fatty. And then some of these lesions were also fatty. So we thought, okay, these are adenomas. Okay. Is there any like granulomatous disease, histosarcoidosis? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You are you you love you know all these rare diseases, but um th th that's not what this were. These were adenomas. She came for a follow-up exam, and I I showed you the the adenomas were bright last time, and then this is her follow-up exam, and now they look dark. Okay. Um, so it's really weird. This is the more delayed phase. Ah. Okay, well, anyway, this is the venous phase. They're also dark. And then I'm going to show you the in and out because I previously showed you. So this is the in phase. And now they're dark on the in phase and they were not like that before. Any any ideas out there? So they're dropping in signal between the um, the in and out of phase. So some a couple of them had fat, but a bunch of them now have iron. Yeah, sorry, this uh, I need to get this. No worries. Okay, so um, uh, Joe was asking if they bled. That's a great thought. Um, they did not bleed. So the interesting part about this case, I'll just jump to the chase is that she was on iron supplementation for iron deficiency anemia. And between the two scans, her adenoma started picking up iron. And if you look it up in the literature, um, actually SPIO, which is super paramagnetic iron oxide, um, is an agent that they've used sometimes to try to see a benign lesion versus a malignant lesion because benign lesions such as FNH and adenomas have Kupfer cells that can take up iron, whereas HCCs and other malignant lesions do not. So there was this like, you know, possibility like, oh, let's use SPIO to distinguish benign from malignant. Um, they've stopped doing or it didn't go that far. But this was just like an interesting case where we saw these. Um, and this patient, actually, the reason they're on iron is because they did excessive blood donations. So they were so generous, they ended up needing iron supplementation. So <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, anyway, that was the case. Iron supplementation like iron? Yeah, she was taking iron supplements for iron deficiency anemia. And um, between those two scans, like that's when they started her iron supplementation and her adenoma started taking up iron. Oh, wow, that's awesome. That's because awesome. they have cup for cells. Yeah. I also read a couple of case reports where giant adenomas caused iron deficiency anemia because they were sucking up so much iron and or and there could have been like small amounts of hemorrhage within them too. Yeah. Me. So this is a different demographic. This is an 83-year-old male. We have a CT scan from uh, two years ago and a recent CT scan. And uh, the patient has had an endovascular stent repair of an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. So what, uh, what do you think about the recent scan? This was a non-con scan, but then a few days, or I, I guess the same day he got a contrast study as well. So any residents want to take it? Yeah, I guess I really like vascular imaging. Um, but what I'm seeing in the not uh, the remind me real quick again that the contrast imaging on the right that one's old is, is okay. Cool? So on the left, so now we see it seems like there's some irregularity along what I'm as presuming the aortic wall at that point. Uh, there's also some stranding um, around the same area. So I'm, I, I think first thing that comes to my mind is, is there a, a contained rupture? Is there pending rupture? Um, 
is there something going on with the aorta that yes, good thought. Aorta's so expanded? if there is a pending, yeah, that is the main differential, right? To rule out a pending rupture. In pending rupture, there's fat stranding, there's irregularities along the wall. There are also though a few prominent lymph nodes near the aorta here. Yeah, so I'm also thinking like, oh, what's causing this? And like the first thing being is I'm worried about infection, mycotic aneurysm. There's some lymph nodes in the area too that are kind of juicy. Um, oh, wow. Um, I um, thought that the, um, they also could have malignancy. This could be an angiosarcoma. Oh, um, oh, on the FDG pet, there's an avid FDG uptake. Uh, throughout I, the aorta, like it's like rim rim uptake, huh? So is there? I guess I you already mentioned to, diagnosis. I'd still met. I'd still favor probably mycotic aneurysm in this patient. That's exactly view. what this is. So basically, the excluded aneurysm sac has just become an abscess now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and you see that it. I think malignancy is a good thought. So with the lymph nodes, the impending rupture becomes less. I mean, it is probably impending rupture, but there was no endoleak before. And it was very rapid uh, chain enlargement, given that before that, like between the EVO and the last study, it has been stable for a very long time and there was no endoleak. And the presence of lymph nodes argues against impending rupture and favors an infectious or malignancy. Malignancy is a great thought. Given how thin the rim is in some parts, its infection is more likely, and this was actually infected. So this is a mycotic aneurysm now. Wow. Yeah, great. Um, I have two little teaching points about um, that mycotic aneurysm. So we, um, especially when you have the stent in place, um, so, you know, like the previous treatment was, um, you know, you go to the OR and they kind of resect it, but they, but then there's like, it's so inflamed and infected that like you could leave stuff behind, et cetera. So we've actually had a couple of cases where we put drains in that excluded, like that infected excluded sac um, and have been able to successfully treat the mycotic aneurysm with drains. So oh, wow. just another. That's yeah. scary. <laughs> yep. Okay, I have one. Okay, so what do you guys think about this? So stomach and um, small bowel are pretty distended. And there's something going on in the left uh, left upper quadrant. So my residents are saying there's something in, um, impinging upon the bowel wall. That's right. Soft tissue mass, good. So this whole thing is a soft tissue mass here. It's got some air in it. Maybe there's like a bowel loop that's being sucked into this thing. So what's your differential for like a big left, you know, um, mesenteric mass, kind of ill-defined borders. What do you guys think it could be? Desmoid okay, good. Odessa, my fellow is saying desmoid carcinoid gist. Perfect. So, okay. So uh, lymphoma, good. Um, lymphoma tends to, um, Sometimes it rises from the bowel wall, but it tends not to cause bowel obstructions because it's more of a soft and blobby tumor. So it pushes vessels aside. It doesn't usually obstruct the bowel. Um, carcinoid, those most more commonly come from the ileum. So they're more commonly met metastasized to the right lower quadrant mesentery. Um, you said also gist. So gist tumors come from the submucosa of bowel. So maybe like, oh, is this arising from this bowel here? But they're usually more encapsulated. And as they get larger, they get more centrally necrotic. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't look that typical for a gist. So um, another thing that was brought up when the scan was read was an adenocarcinoma. So small bowel adenocarcinomas tend to be more apple core lesions and cause obstruction in that way because they're like apple core kind of like colon cancers. So the first thing you said, Odessa, is actually what this ends up being. So this was actually a desmoid fibromatosis. So now some quiz questions for the residents. Uh, who gets desmoid tumors or fibromatosis? Okay, it's, it's more commonly seen in patients with FAP or Gardner syndrome. And then um, you, you can get them, in the, you can get them anywhere, but mesentery, um, rectus sheath, those are common places. And in the mesentery, they can be infiltrated and cause bowel obstructions like this. 
Um, do you know how they treat them? Anyone? Gleevec. No. no uh, so uh, Gleevec was brought up. That's for a GIST tumor. That's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, a lot of times they want to leave these just like the like the, they're they have a high rate of local recurrence. So um, they don't like to resect them because they're basically it's like like, you know, like scar tissue. It's like a keloid. Like the more you uh, disrupt it, the more it's going to recur. Um, but then also they if, if it is progressive or it's causing things, they can do methotrexate and they can do radiation. Um, they can do certain medications as well. I think I think um, some uh, hormone uh uh, repressing medication also. They went in to go um, check this out. They did some biopsies of it. They got the desmoid diagnosis. They could not resect it. It was involving too many, too much small bowel, too many of these mesenteric vessels here. It would have left the patient with like short gut syndrome. So, and, and they just, it was too uh, infiltrative. And so they couldn't resect it. Incidentally, the patient also had, so that was their desmoid. No history of FAP or gardeners, but if their colon is missing, that's what you think about. And then incidentally, they also had this pelvic mass. Oh. So I was like, oh, that's a second desmoid because you can get multiple. And actually this was resected and was an ovarian fibroma. Um, we've not been able to find any association between desmoids and ovarian fibroma. They're both fibrous kind of tumors, but ovarian fibromas you know, are, are just solid tumors of the ovary. They're benign. Do you know what syndrome they can cause? Yes, Meig syndrome, where basically they um, secrete a hormone that causes a pleural, like the, the causes like leaky vessels. And so you get a pleural effusion, you can get ascites, et cetera. And for bonus points, do you know what ORADS this would be on MRI? Five. Two. Oh, really? <laughs> so yes, it's not. So the malignant ones, you know, the ones that like we're thinking about malignant ORADS five are usually like when you have a cystic, you know, like a, a ovarian mass that has true solid components. But when you have a dark, completely solid mass, that's, those are in the like fibroma, thecoma kind of category, which are benign, more benign lesions. And so like that really dark um, thing and the ORADS categorization will lead you down to ORADS too because they technically don't really need to be resected or, you know, you're just a lot less concerned about them. These aren't the ovarian cancers that are like killing people the way that epithelial cancers are. Okay. Every case I pull up, one of my residents says that looks bad. <laughs> They're not diagnoses. <laughs> anyway, okay. So this patient had um, severe bilateral hydro, you can see here. Hydro ureter. And then there's something going on down here in the right lower quadrant, speculated process. And then the ureters basically just go into this like region of the uterus. We don't really know what's going on. So we were concerned about, you know, there's a malignant process involving maybe around the uterus, um, maybe having peritoneal disease in the right lower quadrant, et cetera. Um, and so that was um, the initial thought. Let me. Um, I don't know. I'm very skeptical of that. So much here. Okay, so then they get an MR. And take off the graphics. So the ovaries are here. I'll go to my high resolution of the pelvis. You can see that there's, again, some tethering between the uterus and the rectum. Okay, hold on. Okay, these are the ovaries. We can see that there's something T1 bright here and here. Um, and then this is the Sag. So what do you guys think? I hear it. Yeah, this was also endometriosis. So anyway, this is just a le le little bit more subtle case than Nellie's case, but this is like, you know, the, the more subtle, before you get to the mushroom cap, you can get this like, you know, if you ever see tethering in the back of the uterus, uh, think about endometriosis. 
Um, just like in Nellie's case, these ovaries were sort of pulled in. So when they get like even more pulled in and they're touching each other, we call that the kissing ovary sign. But they're both like kind of socked in and pulled in. And we've got this like tethering here uh, between the uterus and the rectum. We've got like abnormal signal actually in the posterior uterus here. That's probably also the endometriosis involving it. Uh, we also had hematosalpinges. So that in the setting of endometriosis is usually endometrioma in the uh, in the the tubes, and we had, you know, endometriomas in the um, ovaries themselves as well. And then the other interesting thing is that spiculated stuff in the right lower quadrant, you can see it also even has these two, like little T2 spaces. That was all endometriosis. Yep. And it was causing the hydro. So yeah, this was another case of deep infiltrating endometriosis, initially thought, you know, to be malignancy. This is where MRI is great. Because as soon as you start seeing like T T1 bright stuff, tethering, multiple areas, all of those things uh, will go towards endometriosis. So what was the, what was tethering the left ureter? Um, all of this. So like there's all, so let me actually go back to, um, the question was what was tethering the left ureter? And so like, there's even stuff here. Like all of this is all endometriosis, all this dark stuff. Like you should have clean fat planes, right? So the left ureter, you can't see it as well, but basically it was just diving into this area and this ovary with, with like this endometriosis around here. Yeah. Yeah. 75 year old female with recurrent abdominal pain. So this was the initial CT. So what do you think? My my fellow Khan is going to take it. He's now joined us. Great, great. You got this. Um, so we have two axial CT scans. Uh, one looks like portal venous and the other slightly more delayed. Um, so in the region of the pancreas, I see some pancreatic fullness involving the distal pancreatic tail and body. Um, an interface. Oh no! I'm gonna give you the second CT now. Yeah. Should be easier. Ignore the no mobilia and the biliary stuff. Let's focus on the pancreas. Yeah. So again, we see this ill-defined um, fullness in the pancreas. Um, Is it better or worse? It looks like it's better. You think it's different yeah. other than the fullness. There may be a little bit of pancreatic, peripancreatic fluid. Could it be something other than fluid? Um, maybe some scarring or fibrosis. I mean, the pancreas itself looks abnormal. Um, Perfect. So, so when you are saying peripancreatic fibrosis, you mm -hmm. are giving us a diagnosis. What Correct. do you think so might be? I would be concerned be? about autoimmune pancreatitis. Yes, exactly. So this was, a uh, lady was presenting with this non-resolving uh, pancreatic lesion, which we thought it was a mass, but then here we see several signs that are reassuring. First, the mass has decreased in size. It's not increased. We have penetrating duct signs. So the pancreatic duct is penetrating through this lesion and it looks perfectly normal. There is not a lot of distal pancreatic dilation relative to, the, to how big the mass is. There's not a lot, a lot of distal pancreatic atrophy and we have the rim of peripancreatic fibrotic changes. So this is classic... Uh, autoimmune pancreatitis, IgG4 disease. Excellent, good job, Khan. Okay, I have a couple of teaching points there. So you said autoimmune pancreatitis um, and Mal Malik said IgG4. So what's the difference? Are there different types of autoimmune pancreatitis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so not all, yeah, not all autoimmune pancreatitis are IgG4 disease. It could be seronegative or seropositive IgG4 disease. Most of them will display lymphocytic changes and inflammatory changes, uh, but not all of them are seronegative IgG4. It's thought that the histology is very similar, but some around 20% of cases will have serology that's negative for IgG4 disease. Exactly. So the IgG4 disease is a is a multi system disease. Um, so it like you always always especially in the abdomen. If you see the pancreas abnormal, look at the biliary tree to look for sclerosis and cholangitis. Look at the kidneys to look for deposits. Look for retroperitoneal fibrosis, and then look at the salivary glands, the eyes, etc. 
And then of those people that actually have multi-system IgG4 disease, only two thirds will have their, their um, blood, you know, will have elevated IgG4 levels. So there are people that have multi-system IgG4 disease that are still like technically seronegative. Then there's a whole other thing called type two autoimmune pancreatitis. This is only affecting the pan uh, pancreas, it tends to be in younger patients, usually younger male patients, and it responds more to steroids. So the first one is multi-system older patients um, could be seropositive or negative. And then the second one is not related to IgG4, um, but has the same imaging findings and it's only in the pancreas. I see Nellie's back. Um, this, uh, this is a patient with a uh, known history of bladder cancer. Um, so you can see this bladder um, thick wall posterior bladder. And um, this was one of the initial, and then subsequently we got follow-up um, patients on treatment. And at that time we said, um, the rectum looks a little bit thickened. There's kind of stool, um, hard stool, probably, you know, proctitis. Um, and, and, um, it, it was getting worse and we got additional follow-up study. And now that area of rectum looks even more thicker, um, and abnormal. So, uh, and then here's a pet showing that it is metastasis, metastatic disease, um, to the bowel from the urothelial cancer. So the take home point is that, um, I think it's important to provide a differential diagnosis, uh, you know, and for sure, it could totally be proctitis. And I think it's um, reasonable to, you know, uh, say it, it could be something else other than proctitis. Um, so uh, this was just uh, a good learning case um, and a case actually that Cookie shared with me to present and share with you guys. Nice. I've actually seen um, urothelial be really infiltrative like this and kind of sneaky. Um, but especially when it's like the high grade type. So I, I now look at the path and try to see like, oh, is it, you know, is this a lower grade one or a really high grade one? And if you start losing those fat planes like that, like don't forget that urothelial can just like, you know, spread in this kind of insidious infiltrative way. My fellows are, know the case. So they're, they're like, we know this one. But anyway, so um, this patient had lots of, pulmonary nodules. So if I saw that, I would be like, these look like diffuse met metastatic disease. Um, also had a lesion in her breast. Huge mass in the pelvis, but also masses in the musculature here, 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 here. Um, no primary malignancy in this patient was known or they, and, and we now know they don't have a primary malignancy, um, but their uterus had been removed um, for fibroids. So when, you know, previously when they used to do more salation um, diffusely, like in the abdomen without doing it inside of a bag, you could disseminate fibroids and they could grow in different parts of your abdomen. Um, so you could get like diffuse lyomyomatosis. But um, this was a case of benign metastasizing lyomyomatosis. So um, even though her uterus was removed, this thing is a massive lyomyoma. And then all of these other lesions that are now popping up in her muscles um, and in her lungs, all of these are just benign lyomyomas. Um, and they've resected multiple of them and they just keep coming back up. So um, they are supposedly hormonally responsive. It's thought like maybe there's some, you know, hormonally receptive cells that are just getting stimulated by it. And there's a lot of theories, but not really known why certain people get this and why it can be so progressive. And, and uh, but yeah, so anyway, this was a crazy case of, uh, and even like in all the muscles and stuff too, so. So this will be more of a show and tell case because it's a very extensive involvement by, by a disease that we know about, but I just wanted to show it. So numerous uh, vascular lesions throughout almost all the visualized organs, including a lot in the pancreas, innumerable in the liver, 
a few in the stomach, small and large bowel. Any thoughts? HHT? HHT, yep. Yep, that's it. So this is the Osler Weber window or- And actually, this is a beautiful example of how big the hepatic artery gets. Yeah. That like, see that celiac axis right there, right there. Yeah, that whole thing, that's the hepatic artery. So it gets really hypertrophied uh, because they have all these vascular malformations. That's, um, you would think with those aneurysms, they would like maybe be worried and coil them or something. Yeah, so far they are watching. I guess it's, they don't know what, what to call it given how expensive it is. Oh, um, my resident was asking if the patient had heart failure. Do you know? Not that I'm aware of actually, no. That's oh, he's planned for a liver transplant though. So maybe that's why they didn't coil. They're just gonna transplant the liver. Mm, cool. Can I go or? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so this is a patient who came for abdominal pain. Did I already show this case? If, if I did, let me know. Okay, my residents are saying bile ducts and pancreatic head. Oh, pancreatic head, pancreatic head, pancreatic head. Forget headed. the pancreatic head, just the bile okay. ducts. Bile ducts, good. Okay, what about the bile ducts? What? Like Sorry. there's like multifocal areas of build dill with soft tissue around the yep. central bile ducts. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, pancreatic doing? head might also like on the coronal here between the pancreatic head and the duodenum, there's a little bit of hypoattenuating tissue there. Um, I think pancreas is fine. Okay. But let, let's go to um, ERCP. It's like multifocal areas of stricturing, dilation. It doesn't exactly look like PSC. It Is looks it almost stricture? like. Okay, let me go. It looks you, like Victoria's you. case of IgG4 from last week. Oh, wait. Are there introductal stones? What is that? Yeah. Ooh, tell me. Is it oh, RPV? Yeah. So, okay. So then there's zeros of subtraction. Subtraction. So it's. Well, there is enhancing nodule in the yep, CG, yep, yep. In the right mm -hmm. main though. Mm -hmm. IPNB. Yes. So this is okay. Hold on. Let me just show you the ERCP images. Uh, this, yes. So it, there's feeling defects right there. Right there. You see that? Yes, we see it. And my residents are yeah. saying, wow. And then they also said, we're making up acronyms. What acronyms? Huh? They, <laughs> oh. Just because they hadn't heard of IPNB, <laughs> they said we made it up. Nice. All right, teach us about IPMB, our theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is the like IPMN version in the bile ducts. Uh, so basically what we used to call biliary cystadenoma, we now call MCN and IPMB. And IPMB is when you see like dilations of the bile ducts with little soft tissue nodules in it, like papillomatosis or papillary fronds in it. Um, it doesn't always have mucin. And it doesn't always have cancer, but so it's different than cholangio. Usually cholangio, we don't see like these soft tissue nodules within dilated bile ducts. Yeah, that's a great case. Um, if it was stones, if they were not enhancing, that's when you get intra intrahepatic introductal stones, we start thinking about the infectious um, recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, the, the endoscopy correlate. The, pap the papillary projection into the lumen of the bile ducts. Oh my that God, it's talk. beautiful. Looks like we're scuba diving. <laughs> and um, the, yeah, so like this is spyglass basically. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, that's a great case. Okay, so this patient under just went underwent a split liver transplant. So they got half of a liver and post- transplant, they ended up with this fluid collection along their, the margin of their liver. So we're like, okay, we think it's probably a biloma. Um, I want to draw your attention to 
the vessels. So this is their artery. You can follow it here and here. And then it gets quite narrow right there. Do you believe me? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so um, then they went and got a Doppler, their LFT started rising. So then they went and got a Doppler ultrasound and the, the, the um, velocity in here was over 200. So it was like, you know, low before and after, but in this area where we were worried about, it was, um, it was over 200. So we thought there was truly a stenosis in this area. And then they went and got a um, angiogram and we can see that there's truly a stenosis there. So they, oops. I will cut that out later. Um, they did a stent. Let's see if I can show you the stent. No, that's not it yet. They went and stented it and now it is open. And actually, I thought all of this looked abnormal too, but turns out that was just transient spasm that, that wasn't there before, or it wasn't there afterwards. So um, good thing I wasn't stenting it because I would have been like, we need to stent this whole thing. So anyway, the point, um, the interesting point is that we believe that this, um, this narrowing might have been caused by this biloma, like maybe that the hepatic artery was kind of bathed in this bile. And so that caused irritation of the vessel and narrowing there. Um, and it ended up showing increased velocities on the ultrasound. So um, they ended up treating it with a stent. And the LFTs have now come down. Uh, we did drain the biloma as well, yeah. So take away the problem, good. 